things are heating up uh, and the world uh, can no longer uh, simply observe if it ever could, we absolutely have to pick up the pace of engagement. We also know that despite our attempts to come to grips with this complexity of rising population, shifting global economy, and evidence of serious and intensifying environmental threats, we have not yet found ways to move the world towards what is called sustainable development. GEO5 looked at 90 of the internationally agreed environmental goals of the past two decades and found that significant progress, significant progress has been made in only four, yes, that's right, four out of 90. By 2015, uh, that is the MDG deadline, more than 600 million people will lack access to improved sources of drinking water. Uh, more than 2.5 billion people will lack access to ba basic sanitation, which is a euphemism for toilets. That is one third of humanity. Unsafe water and lack of sanitation are the reason 3,000 children under the age of five die every day of dehydration and di di diarrhea. These diseases are also a major cause, uh, as you understand, of childhood malnutrition. So runaway climate change is a manifest risk. Let me pause here. I think I made my point, haven't I? We are on a dangerous trajectory. We now have a $70 trillion world economy still growing at more than 3% per year. What it means is nothing less than the fact that humanity, because of our size in number and because of our productivity on average per person, has assumed such a huge role in the flux of materials and uh, basic uh, transformation on the earth that humanity has, in essence, overtaken fundamental earth systems. How on earth will we live together as 9 billion people by 2050 on this planet in which um, access to resources, in which inequity, in which uh, also development opportunities still arise in very different realities and contexts, that economic progress is conditional upon progress in the social and the environmental domain, that environmental sustainability will only be feasible if we address economic and social dimensions of development. When we speak about this and young people try to engage with it in, in Nigeria, for instance, there's a big reality check. Um, the livelihoods are about here and now. Uh, they, some cases don't have tomorrow to look at. Um, and then the light, and when we do have, and you're empowered, you're looking to the lifestyles um, that we want to find alternatives for. We have to see some hope um, down the road that we're going to have, have an investment in our lives that are going to make a difference um, to all of us taking part in, in look, taking care of our, our planet today. Number one, that climate change is happening. It is not an issue of tomorrow. It is an issue of today. Number two, that something is being done, not enough, but something is being done by both governments and the private sector. So the challenge here is how to inject more speed and higher scale to the momentum that is already underway because it is clear that neither the scale nor the speed of the transformation is enough. So rolling the climate dice, that's, that's what we're doing. And the dice are loaded. There's a danger that we can past tipping points, such as some of the, these are some of the really big gambles that we're taking. Uh, the way ice sheet disintegration works is as the ocean gets warmer, it begins to melt the ice shelves, the tongues of ice that reach out into the ocean and buttress the ice sheets. And as they melt, the ice streams can surge and deliver icebergs to the ocean much faster and eventually lead to disintegration of the ice sheet and, and sea level rise of many meters. The history of the Earth tells us that these, 
these gambles are ones that we're going to lose. Society at all levels, local, national, regional, and global, should have three basic objectives or three core bottom lines, and that all three are vital for our well-being and for the achievement of any of the other two. These are the goals of economic development, especially the eradication of extreme poverty, the goal of social inclusion, which means, on the one side, honoring human rights, gender equality, the rights of indigenous populations, the rights of minority groups, and also fostering a truly socially inclusive environment in which we can thrive, meaning a high level of social trust, decent governance, uh, low levels of uh, government corruption, and so forth. And the third pillar of sustainable development is the environment. We need a new generation of professionals, people who can design, manage, and evaluate holistic approaches to sustainable development. We send our students out to multi-sector development projects and programs around the world. And last year, Columbia sent 40 students out to 16 countries to do their field placements. We are now undertaking joint projects to diagnose sustainability uh, challenges involving the Columbia students and the students from the respective uh, institutions around the world. This is real work with real products and we hope will lead to real impacts. Finally, with relation to how do we strengthen the rural infrastructure and services, providing income incentives to work in rural areas in order to slow down the migration process. I firmly believe, from my experiences here, that the future stability not only of China, but of the world in general, lies in educating, elevating, and empowering people to make sensitive and intelligent choices, both for our own destiny and for that of our planet. We see education as both an indicator and an agent of development. By teaching children and youth to think sustainably through a multi-sectoral lens, we may foster a future population that is mindful of the far-reaching consequences of their actions. In Canada, however, the current education system continues to discount and disregard Aboriginal knowledge and methodologies. By excluding other ways of life, we are losing out on knowledge and insights which can promote sustainability. Fossil fuels appear to be the cheapest energy. They're not really cheapest. They're cheapest only because they're subsidized and because they don't have to pay their cost to society. The human health costs of air and water pollution from burning fossil fuels and the costs of climate change. These are, are left for the public. The clear solution requires putting a price on carbon. There is no doubt that a few years from now, low carbon living will be the norm and not the novelty that it is now. What would bring about an increased scale and speed is the increasing realization on the part of countries that they need to do this not necessarily to improve the state of the planet, but rather and most urgently because of their own self-interest. It's clear from all uh, assessment, all reviews, all reports that were seen that it's a, that the 10% broadband penetration will lead to 1% sustainable uh, GDP. And I think that's our job now in this sustainability to use all these technology tools to actually address how we can change the society. While demands are low, put a source at that setting which is a local source, distribute electricity with that local source, and as demands grow, then you can add infrastructure and bring that grid in later. So it's a notion of can we start at a lower cost, and it happens that when you start small, actually solar energy makes a lot of sense because of its scalability. We cannot undo the damage, but we can limit its impact and prepare for the future. The time for concerted and coordinated action is now. If we share responsibility, we can share the rewards of a planet preserved. 
So let's change sustainable development from a trendy phrase to a lifestyle practice. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. There is no plan B, there is no planet B.